Now we have the wind tunnel built, it's time for the tests. So the goal we want to achieve is to understand how the wind affects different objects. So we have multiple hypotheses. Uh, the first one being that relative speed will have an impact on the wind resistance. So that's the speed of the object in the speed of the wind. Then we have the mass. Will that make a difference? Then the surface area. So is it, for example, linearly or exponentially um, proportional? And then the shape, is it, um, does a 2D shape, like a circle or square, um, does that have an impact? Or a 3D shape, like a sphere or hemisphere or cube? And finally, roughness, is it smooth, sticky, rough? Will that make a difference? So before doing any experiments, I'd like to explain how we measure the wind resistance to an object. So the wind comes through the opening on the left and hits the object. This force is then transferred to a load cell through a threaded rod. A load cell consists of a metal core and two strange gauge that deform when pressure is applied. This generates an electrical signal in the range of millivolts, which needs to be amplified before entering the Arduino. That is why we use the HX711. This latter amplifies the low electrical output and converts the analog to digital values. Load cells come in different capabilities, such as mass limitations or precision. Anyways, so the HX711 goes to the Arduino, which then sends the data over to processing. Processing is very similar to the Arduino IDE, but is more uh, visual and can be used without an Arduino board. In the end, the force value will be displayed as a bar with a proportional height. Over time, we can see the peak that we note down for each object. We did not calibrate the force gauge, so we don't have any real units, but since we are simply comparing values, it's fine. The mass. So to do this experiment, uh, we took a cube and tested four different mass by putting weight in them. So 30, 100, uh, 190, and 350 grams. And on this graph, we clearly see a constant wind resistance for whatever mass measurement. We can therefore reject our hypothesis. A massive car will receive the same amount of force as the same shaped cardboard car. But we can easily imagine that the cardboard shaped car will fly away easily while the real car will stay put. Now why is that? The answer is inertia. Inertia is the resistance of the object to any change in its motion or direction. Both cars would have inertia, but the massive car would have more inertia. The mass doesn't interest us in the aerodynamic way. Next, the shape. Of course, while doing these tests, all variables were kept constant, such as wind speed or object uh, surface. After seeing those results, we can safely say that the 3D and 2D different shapes have a definitive effect on the wind force. We can see, for example, that a sphere is two times more penetrating in the air than a cube. This means that the force of the wind on a cubic car is twice as much as on a sphere car or streamlined car. And this is quite surprising since we see a lot of cubic cars in Japan. This means that practicality came over energy. Furthermore, we can see that the disc has a value of 13, while the square has a value of approximately 13.5. The ratio is about 3.8% and this is quite close to the 5% found in the Airship Aerodynamic Technical Manual of 1941. 
This is a photo of drag coefficients of generic shapes. The drag coefficient is a number used to model all of the complex dependencies of drag on shape, inclination, and some flow conditions. The force of the wind on an object is proportional to the drag coefficient of that object. We can therefore compare our results to this table. On the example of the sphere and cube, we have a percent error of about 10%. This probably comes from our sensor imprecision. The next test is the surface error. So a parachute has great lift, or drag from falling. So the bigger the parachute, the higher the lift, right? It therefore seems intuitive that a big surface object will have more wind resistance than a smaller surface object. By the way, the surface of a sphere exposed to direct wind is the area of the disk of the same radius. From our results, we can validate our hypothesis. We can therefore suppose that the surface is directly proportional to the wind resistance. Next test is the relative speed. Now, what is relative speed? Um, to understand, we're going to look at a, an example. So a car going at 50 km per hour with a direct wind speed of 20 km per hour will be subject to a relative speed of 70 km per hour. It will receive the same wind resistance as a car going at 70 km per hour without any wind. So we simply add the car speed and the wind speed to get relative speed. And this is true if the wind is front facing. If it is an angle alpha, the wind speed taken into account is the product of the real wind speed and the cosine of that angle. With alpha equals to 45 degrees, for example, and real wind speed equals to 15 km per hour, then the speed we're going to take into account is 10.6 km per hour. Anyways, for our tests, the wind was always front facing, so alpha equals to 0 degrees. We don't have an anemometer, which we could make in another video, to measure the speed of the wind, but uh, we can vary the motor speed by varying the signal going to the ESC, electronic speed controller. That's why we have a percentage of the speed. We can test the resistance at 0% speed, 25, 50, 75, and 100% speed. And from our results, we can distinguish a straight line. This would mean that wind resistance of an object is directly proportional to the wind speed. But actually, here is the formula of the wind force, and we see that it is proportional to the velocity squared. We also see the mass density of the fluid, the surface area, and the drag coefficient. Now we're done with the science part. I just wanted to have fun by playing around with some shapes. So I tested the hemisphere. So it's a, it was a sphere that I cut in half. And I wanted to test uh, if it really was the shape and I got pretty much the same results for the sphere and the hemisphere the hemisphere was a bit uh, less good but now I want to test if it's just um, the surface or if it's the, the shape that actually acted in this because in the sphere I didn't have this curved bit on the other side, so the air hits this and it er abruptly uh, stopped here. And therefore it was uh, not as good, but it was very similar. Now I want to see if it's really the shape. So I've done uh, a circle, or a disc, it has the same diameter, so the same surface, or almost as you can see, as the hemisphere. I'll test this now and uh, see if it's better or worse or the same. I think it's gonna be uh, worse because it's just a flat surface and I think there's a real effect by the shape. 
of the object. So let's test it. So now I've done the disk and compared it to the other values I found. Well, it's very similar to the cube because it's the same surface. And so this means that the things behind do have an effect because uh, as we saw here, uh, it's the same, exact same thing. Just we put stuff uh, on top. Now what would be interesting is by just taking a cube and putting uh, this sort of hemisphere uh, shape on the cube, would that help? I think it will, because as we saw here, it's the things in front that have an effect. So technically, if I take the cube and put this, it should drastically change or improve it. So this is the test uh, of a cube without the hemisphere. So this is the exact same test with the hemisphere. So it did uh, wobble a bit, but um, it was a bit similar. It was better. What I want to try now is uh, to cut these corners and leave a long trail behind it, even if it's just square, like this here, here on all sides. I'm just going to take off uh, this little bit all the way, and then we'll see if uh, there's an effect or not. This is the test with the cube that doesn't have its corners anymore, with the hemisphere. So this was a 9 instead of a 13. That was just because I took off the corners right here on the four sides. So as you can see, we only see, well, the sphere. What I thought would happen was um, the air would flow on, this, on the hemisphere and when it arrived here, it would actually go inside and hit and hit the backboard, which would in turn put just as much force. Uh, apparently it doesn't. Now I want to test with putting tape, and so it will have the same shape, but the air won't go in. So my hypothesis is that this will get even better. What I'm testing is the lack of holes right there. Overall, this was really fun. The whole process of carrying out an experiment with a tool we created, noting down the results and then figuring out what they mean was very interesting and I will do something similar in the future. Now, things we could have tested else. Um, we didn't test the angle of the object relative to the oncoming air. This could have shown that different angles of attack of a shape also has an effect. This is obviously true for plane wings. What really would have been interesting to study is the lift created by passing air over a surface. In our setup we measured drag, but an airplane needs wings to produce lift via the air. This lift needs to be greater than the weight of the airplane. So it would have been interesting to measure the lift created by different shapes. Furthermore, when climbing or descending, the angle of the tack changes and consequently affects the lift, which we could have measured as well. One last interesting thing to dive into would be hydrodynamics. I might make a water current tunnel in the future. Anyways, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.